Adapted from the popular 2015 fictional podcast by Zach Eikers and Skip Bronke and directed by Rebecca Thomas, Limetown is a creative response to the popularization of true crime podcast. The story follows podcast host and modern day detective Leah Haddock, played brilliantly by Jessica Biel. <laughs> as she explores a mass disappearance at a research facility in Limetown, Tennessee. Today, we are screening the first two episodes. Afterwards, be sure to stay in your seats because we're gonna have an extended Q&A with the creators and cast. Um, before we start though, I'd like to welcome Zach and Skip to the stage to say a few words. Hi, I'm, I'm Skip. This is Zach, and uh, you know, just the first thing we wanted to say is thank you so much for supporting the show. Thank you for being here. <laughs> thank you to Tiff for having us. It is a small miracle that Limetown went from the little podcast it is to this. So we, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> None of this is real, right? <laughs> so, uh, so what you're watching is the first two episodes. They are going to air on Facebook watch on October 16th and then there will be new episodes every week after that uh, so enjoy that's all we have to say and stick around for the Q&A uh, better people than us will be there and it will be wonderful <laughs> great cool yeah thank you all right so it is time for a Q&A <laughs> so without further ado please welcome Zach Eikers the uh, creator Skip Bronke the creator Rebecca Thomas, the director, Jessica Beale, the star and executive producer, and Michelle Purple, the executive producer, to the stage to. How did that feel? <laughs> 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 really big. <laughs> <laughs> Bigger than you thought. We're watching it on our little screens. Yeah. It's really big on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to start by talking really about um, how the podcast was really first thought of and, and the conception of that because this is obviously an extension of the podcast. So um, looking to Zach and Skip to kind of Start it off. Yeah, I mean, it, it, the assumption about Limetown is that it's a re response to things that existed in the world, but it actually was sort of a, it was a way for Skip and I to work together, one, but also sort of like a void of something that, that we, we realized uh, in 2013 when I was riding a subway car, I noticed there were a lot of people with headphones on. And, uh, oh, is this on? I don't Test, on. hello? Hello, hello, hello. Mine is on. Mine's not. Oh, yeah. hey, hello. Uh, so I noticed a lot of people were wearing headphones, and it and it felt like here's an audience that hasn't really been tapped into in in a in a fictional narrative way. So I called Skip and I just said we should do a fictional podcast, which at that point didn't really exist. And and so he said, okay, that sounds like a great idea. Why is no one else doing it? And I said, I don't know. And he said, okay, let's do it. So <laughs> then we started uh, building it out from there. And sort of, it was a series of questions, like what's the best story for this format? What's the best format for this format? How do you, how do you tell a compelling story? And it just started a, a series of events that led to it. it. One step was realizing that oral history was a really important way, or a really uh, natural way to tell a story in podcasting, sort of intimate storytelling that, that tells the history of a larger event. And so it's like, well, what's the event? I don't know. Uh, one day I just had an idea, a town disappears, skip again. Why? And I said, I don't know. I said, okay, well, let's build from there. And so it just led to a series of questions that sort of like filled out the world, sort of things that scared us about the world and like what stories we wanted to tell. And, and it, it just eventually led to all this. Yeah, so. one, one quick thing that's kind of crazy is we finished the pilot 
And we were like, this sounds like something we haven't heard before. Maybe we should try to get a distributor because that could help get more people to listen to it. And we spent six months taking it out to you know, NPR or Gimlet or all these other radio and podcasting networks, and no one knew what to do with it because they were like, podcasts are nonfiction. So they either were just like, no, this isn't for us. We only do nonfiction, or they didn't get back to us. Mostly and didn't get back to us. <laughs> <laughs> and we just set sort of a bucket date. <laughs> it was like, if nobody gets back to us by this date, we're going to release it. And we did, and within weeks that had millions of listens so it was the best thing that ever happened to us <laughs> and no well, one got back to us <laughs> i think that's something uh, great about a podcast is it has this built-in audience that you can kind of um kind of when you're adapting into a series you can kind of rely on in a way um when was that first point in the podcast where you realize oh this is a thing like pe people are loving this well, I mean, just to be clear, the only thing that existed when we released the podcast was the pilot episode. Mm -hmm. And I had written a draft of the second episode. We had an outline for the whole season, but nothing else existed because we didn't want to spend the emotional capital on something that no one would care about, you know? So it was just like, let's put this out into the world and see how it goes. And it went nuts. And it was just one of those things where it was like, okay, well, now we have to produce a show in real time. So when we released it, you know, August 1 of 2015 through December 15 of 2015, we produced the five other episodes in real time, like as it was going. And it's still probably the most intense experience <laughs> production wise. But uh, it was, I mean, it was within the first week of the pilot that we realized that it was something bigger uh, than we had planned on. And actually uh, the, the day before I got married, uh, it was uh, the day that it went to number one on iTunes. And that was just like, <sighs> uh, <laughs> I handed my phone to my mom and I was just like, here, keep this for the rest of the weekend. I have to get married now. And, and like that, but that led to sort of everything and how our lives changed sort of radically in that moment. But, you know, we also had to produce the show. So we mostly ignored everyone <laughs> until January of 2016. So it was it was a crazy experience. What was the moment in which um, it was the potential of it being a series? And how did that start and happen? Well, uh, when we first met uh, with WME, our, our agency, they asked us what we wanted to do next. And just sort of on a lark, it was like, eh, I guess we could make this a TV show. And they're like, okay. And we're like, wait, what? That's all it takes? Okay, great, we're gonna make a TV show. So uh, that, but that happened again in 2016. And so it was a, it was a process to get it to where it is. But uh, that was the moment when a gatekeeper just said, okay, walk through. <laughs> and so we did. Smart, smart idea to go through that door. <laughs> um, uh, question for Jessica: When when did you uh, first learn about the podcast and really get involved uh, in the series? I first learned about the podcast what just l last year. Yes, just last year we learned about the. Po I'm a huge podcast fan. I don't know how. I actually just realized how I missed this. I had just or I was about to have my son. That's how I missed it. I literally, as you were saying the years, I was like, oh, that's what happened. That'll that's what that. happened. I was in a dark black hole. And I came out of it and then still didn't find it. And we, so let's see. We only found it because these guys sent it to us and said, hey, we're, this is our podcast. We are trying to make this into a show. Are you interested in this thing? And we listened to it right away. I thought it was real. 100%, I thought, oh my God, I am such a moron. How did I miss this? How did this news cycle fly by me? I, I just missed it and I, I'm so embarrassed. And, and, and I was Googling Leah Haddock and Googling Limetown and I called Michelle and I said, oh my God, we have to do this, this thing is crazy. What, she goes, it's not real, it's not real. I said, you're wrong, you're 100% wrong. You're wrong, this is so real. And then I got her thinking it was real and then she had to call our agents and double check because I was for sure that this thing was real. Anyway, that's how good it, you know, in my opinion, the content was and is and the story is. And so 
really it started there. And, you know, we listened to the whole thing. Then we started to have conversations with these guys. And then we started to realize, I started to realize what a cool opportunity this could be to dive into this character because the character in the podcast and the character in the show, kind of different, you know, it's a, such a different format. And we really had to, you know, kind of pull out a lot of things to put her on the screen as opposed to just put her in your ear. Yeah, that kind of leads me to my next question, this idea of developing something when all you have is, is audio to kind of develop a character from. Um, what was it about Leah that, that drew you to her uh, and, wanted you, and made you want to play her? Well, so many things. I mean, number one, actually, it wasn't, it's not just audio that we had. These guys have also written a book about Limetown and about in more specifically Emil, Emil's character and sort of his past before Limetown. So there's a wealth of information and like a breadth of knowledge that it's just a pot of stuff that we could just stick our hands in and pull stuff out. So there was so much to work with initially. And what we just started doing is we, you know, when we, we, we locked, you, you said this earlier, we locked ourselves in a conference room for two weeks, all of us and our other producer who couldn't be here today. Um, and we just went through scene by scene and talked about who is Leah? And we went back to her family. What's her trauma? What's the dysfunction? What happened when she was little? What happened? Where, you know, uh, we've ob obviously teased just a little bit about her connection with her uncle and his connection to Limetown. So we kind of go back to that. And we start from scratch when she was little and we just started to build this person and her pathos and her psychology and where she was gonna go, what we were gonna learn about her, how deep and dark are her, are her demons and secrets. And that's when it started to become really clear that we had, I had a real opportunity. We, th these guys, everyone has given us a real opportunity, given me an opportunity to put somebody really interesting on screen who is very complex and you you know we just kind of give a we dabble a, dabble a little bit of what she's about in these first two episodes and hopefully she's compelling i think she's com compelling oh she is <laughs> uh, <laughs> definitely <laughs> rebecca so i have a uh, fun fact i've actually um uh, the co-host of a tiff podcast we do and i can't imagine uh that podcast being shot in any interesting way. It's in a dark studio. It's just us sitting there, and it's it's really dry. I love a challenge. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, you kind of proved me wrong with this series. The the fact that you can make um, uh, someone in a booth um, uh, working through uh, the prep to create a podcast thrilling and interesting. How did you approach that? Well, I got Jessica Beale and some good material, first of all. So I have to say, like, you can't really do much if the script is bad. And, that, you know, if the actress is an uphill battle of it, this was just a blessing, super huge blessing for me to have all this to work with in the first place. Um, but, you know, mainly it was working with my DP, Julie Kirkwood, and just figuring, yeah, love her, figuring out our lenses, our choices that we shot the whole season together. So it was the arc of the entire season um, and really trying to get into Leah's psychology and, and every time time we found that we were not rooted in her we sort of the show sort of goes off the rails a little bit so anytime we could pull it back into her and give her special lenses give her special space and of course we're in a tv universe and didn't, you know we there are limits to what you can do it was just figuring out the language for the show so that it could feel like you were living everything Jess was just explaining living her trauma living you know her all those fanciful moments she has, all of the weird sexual spaces she takes us into, that all of that stuff was very intriguing to us and stuff that we wanted to be really playful with. But always as a director, I just want to sort of, I don't want you to feel me too much. You know, I want, I want the story and the, and the characters to take us through it. And as the season goes on, um, per the podcast, I was trying to parallel the podcast, the tone sometimes shifts with each survivor that Leah encounters. So that was a great challenge, but also why I was just so happy that these guys let me came on to do it because it was, you know, it just makes my wa my mouth water even thinking about it. I'm such a dork, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs>
Um, my next question, and this is for everyone, really. Um, we're seeing more and more podcasts being adapted to series. Um, for instance, Dirty John, Lore, Homecoming, which was a prime time last year. Uh, what makes this medium translate so well to the screen in your mind? Well, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is actually a challenge, but also an opportunity. Like in podcasting, you know, you're usually listen to it, listening to it alone, so it's very solitary. Uh, more format. It's literally in your head if you're wearing headphones, and so it can be incredibly intimate and spooky, and it kind of it puts you in a vulnerable spot. And it's actually one of the challenges of bringing it to TV is how do you recreate that? And I think that that's something that Becca did so well is finding ways to bring that intimacy to the show and make it vulnerable and make it spooky and get under your skin in sort of a way that it seems like only audio can do, but actually she found a way to do it in television. Yeah, and I think in podcasting, too, uh, storytellers are taking more chances. They're taking bigger chances. And also, um, it, there's no barrier between creator and audience. And so you're getting a lot of freedom of expression in these podcasts that I think stands out, that I think draws people sort of to bolder storytelling than, than maybe they're used to. And it's also you know, a produced show of a story. So if it has an audience, that means that people know it's successful. They know that the, there's an audience for it. So I think that that is part of what people tap into podcasts for as well. Yeah, Michelle and I were actually just talking outside about that, that idea of the ability to take risks and in different mediums and the risks that you can take in a podcast and, and even in a series that are harder to take potentially with film. Um, my next question is around, um, so I know this is one large team, but there's also kind of two teams in a way on, on stage, uh, uh, a team of executive producers that have worked together uh, and uh, two, uh, a team of two uh, people who created this amazing podcast and, and series. Um, I was wondering what makes you work so well as it's with your partner? <laughs> she does what I say. She drives me to meetings. <laughs> what up? She lives in fear of me. No, we have a very similar sensibility, and we ha always have, and it's something we've connected on. And we just have fun, and we are grateful for what we get to do. And I think that's a priority for us is to just get behind projects that speak to both of us. And we like we have to do this. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Also, you're really good at things I'm not good at, and I'm good at things that you're not good at. It's kind of simple, <laughs> like that. <laughs> I, I want to steal an answer on this one. It's like the best answer I've ever heard given to this was uh, from Christine Vachon, and they were asking her, like, what makes killer films work? How has it lasted for all these years? And she said, at the beginning of a project, we always make sure, we get in a room and we make sure we're making the same film. And I think that this whole team did that. And we talked about being locked in a conference room for weeks. We just got in a room and made sure we were making the same TV show. It's something Zach and I have always done before every project, and, and we did it together. Um, question for Zach and Skip. Uh, so Limetown is a, pod, is a podcast that has two full seasons, and, and you mentioned the book as well. Uh, how do you decide what the pacing looks like when you're adapting it to the series? What do you decide to like show and what not to show and what to save? Zach? <laughs> well, the, the first season of the television series uh, is the first season of the podcast. So like that is one to one because um, we feel like that is the best way to lay the groundwork for where we want this world to go and sort of like it, 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 it expands it in a way that gives us a little more freedom. So I think going forward, uh, we have a lot of ideas and concepts that already exist that we can pull from. But I think that, you know, in the TV space, it will keep expanding. That would be the idea anyway. You're lucky enough to do that. <laughs> and in terms of the people that know the podcast really well, how do you keep that audience on their toes uh, with the series um, so that the mystery is still there? You'll have to watch the show to see how we did that. <laughs> I thought that something was something we definitely tried to do. Well, and, and, and just to say it too, I also think that, you know, something that existed in the podcast was a very public presentation of Leah Haddock. It's her editing a show. It's her very 
carefully curating what you know about her and how you see her. And with the television show, we're able to expand on her as a character and sort of like explore all these parts that she hid and all of these parts that went into making the show. And so I think that alone sort of is a launching pad for a lot of parts of the show that just are new, that will be engaging, I think. And there's also characters that don't exist in the podcast that are in the show. There are things that Leah does that like big moments in her story that do not exist at all in the podcast. So there will be a lot of familiar things, but you know, with Rebecca's vision and language and you know perspective coming beneath it, which is similar but different to you know these guys when they were making their podcast, and there will be big things that will be unexpected that just never existed before, which which is what happened in the two weeks in the conference room where we were battling and sweating and crying and. <laughs> just becoming primal, disgusting human beings until we figured this thing out. <laughs> so there's a lot of surprises, I think. It's exciting. Um, so Limetown premieres on Wednesday, October 16th on Facebook Watch. I had a question. Um, what makes Facebook Watch the right platform for Limetown? I mean, everyone's on Facebook every day. It's, it's prime to have content. I already watch content on it. It's one click away. So... It makes sense. It's it, they and the bigger thing is you can have a conversation after every episode. That to me is the most exciting part. Is from week to week, audience can have their water cooler moment together and talk about what happened, what they think is going to happen. Yeah, and and also a big thing for us that we learned through making the podcast is is one of the good things about podcasting is it's free and it's accessible to everyone. And we had a lot of people reach out to us and tell us how important that was in their lives when they, they were not able to afford certain forms of entertainment and it sort of gave them an escape. And so that means a lot to us, you know, as creators that, that people uh, could find content. And one of the great things about Facebook is it's also free and accessible and you can put prestige television out there for anyone to watch. And that's really important to us as well. And connectivity, right? There's so much about that in our show as it goes on, how we connect with each other and how, you know, the advances in our culture, in our world, how that can either bring us together or pull us apart. And, you know, Facebook is about connecting with your community and connecting with, you know, people from far away and from and close by. And it's it's kind of like oddly synchronistic in that way, like weirdly so, you know. <laughs> Yeah, I remember when I first saw the episodes, it, it just made total sense to me that the, these, this, this show and, and this platform working really well together, and uh, I'm excited for audiences to see the rest. Uh, going to our audience in the room, I'm uh, going to um, I'm going to point out to someone who has their hand up. We have some mic runners, I believe. Uh, maybe not. I'm getting the nod. Not <laughs> so. Use your uh, your big room voice uh, and uh, raise your hand, and we will come to you. So there's a question. Oh, there's a question over here first. Uh, the question's for Jessica. You talked about you thought Limetown was real, and when you talked about Leah, you talked about her like she's real. I'm just curious. How are you able to become that on the screen? Disassociate from that, and then choose. I'm just a sociopath. <laughs> uh, no, um, it's a really good question. I mean, it's 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 one of those questions that I think, as an actor, people are curious about. I'm curious about it too, because there is a disassociation, and somehow, for me, working with a team like this from sort of the ground up and being able to develop this character and start over and look at every scene by scene. It's almost as if I'm getting all of my preparation to understand her pathos and her psychology weeks and weeks and months before I ever have to step on set, before I ever put on a piece of her costume or her hair or anything. So there's so much work being done for me as I'm absorbing and talking it out and spitballing ideas 
that this kind of a thing, this kind of experience and this kind of performance, for me, I can slide into it really easily and I can disassociate. I can step out of my life and I can step into my trailer and into the makeup trailer and put her on and get on set and it just happens. It's a little intangible. It's, it's very hard to describe. I, I hope that was something. She, she would like walk on set and we'd block the scene and we'd go through it and she wouldn't be in it yet and then I'd call action and all of a sudden she would be in this like psych, you know, the state that she needed to be in crying or whatever and I'd call cut and I think it was really good and she'd be like, great. And like, <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Thanks, Jess. Thanks, Beck. All right. <laughs> she can just do it. I don't really, I can't fully describe it and I think a lot of actors might say the same. It's just one of these weird things. It's like a, it's almost like an out-of-body experience. You step out of yourself, and I'm only able to do it in a in a really um, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? In like in a really authentic way, with this kind of deep, deep dive preparation development. It, it's harder to just you know, oh, someone gives you the script, you get the offer, and like, oh, okay, and then you just show up on set. And you have to do a lot of preparation at home and you're sort of by yourself like trying to figure it out and where, how's my, what's my way in? Who is this person? What are her goals? You know, I'm getting to do all of that out loud. So that for me is the way that I can disassociate, like you say. Yeah, there were multiple times on set when she would do a scene and I would go to her and be like, are you okay? <laughs> and she's like, yeah, fine. <laughs> You're doing it again? I'm like, what are you? <laughs> All right, other questions? Right in the center here. As I was watching this, I was uh, remembering Orson Welles and his War of the Worlds broadcast and how much your imagination was playing into the, the story here. I was wondering if you're, you had that in mind when you were making that, whether you're fans of that. And, and I've never seen the creators scratched out before. <laughs> well, uh, uh, but yeah, I mean, of course, uh, War of the World is sort of like the pinnacle of, of the audio medium and, and it's sort of the idea of playing into reality to tell a fictional story. Uh, you, you certainly draw those comparisons, but we were also, uh, believe it or not, we weren't trying to fool anyone into thinking that this was real. You know, we wanted people to be in on the fact that it was a fictional experience, but you know, of course. <laughs> Except for some of the morons yeah. <laughs> the world we like never, me. We never tried to lie to anyone, but it was important to feel authentic, just like the World of the Worlds bro broadcast, that sort of like you could allow yourself to immerse in the story and have a really intimate, real experience with it. And that was, that was certainly really important to us. Uh, as that question was in, in regards to inspirations, were there other inspirations that you had in the creative process? I mean, I, I think the one sort of piece of, of media that sort of like opened our eyes to something like this was actually strangely World War Z, the book, like when we read it, like it, actually Skip was reading it and he was just like, this is a really smart way to tell a bigger story through these small stories. And of course that's drawn from Studs Terkel's The Good War and, 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 and so it's a, it's a very specific style of storytelling that's journalistic and that sort of unlocked like, oh, we could do that in this medium. Uh, so. I, I think that's one. I don't know if you have. No, yeah. <laughs> All right. Other questions? There's a question here. I hope so. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, it was very deliberate. I mean, the, the fact that, that, you know, we were shooting this like a film and we, we shot all 10 episodes sort of all at once, sort of consecutively, we realized that we had the opportunity to sort of layer things in a way and sort of like bring in characters when we want to and, and show them, but you don't know who they are yet. And then later you're like, oh, it's, it's Winona or and there's more there's certainly more of that as the show continues where uh, things are sort of hidden in plain sight and then they make sense as you continue forward that that was 
very intentional on our part. I just want to say what Zach just said, that we block shot all 10 episodes for Becca and Jess to be able to pull that off. It's incredibly difficult and unheard of, and I still don't know how you both did. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's really not a, we did it's it somehow really, truly <laughs> truly a, f a feat I mean what this woman accomplished uh, uh, directed all 10 with no breaks and I mean Thanks, I don't even guys. know <laughs> thank you we're, we're indebted to you forever yeah and part of it was because we want we you know like day one we were shooting episode 10 day 50 we were shooting part of episode one so it was this big puzzle to put together in this five hour series but it was because we wanted to layer everything so that you at least had it in your subconscious as you were getting to episode five episode seven you're like oh I know that person and it starts to build and this sort of rough stone starts rolling and goes faster and faster but even as we were going along there were even moments where we, we realized we had messed up mm -hmm. and we should have put someone or a character in that big sequence in the beginning and we were all like, oh, I mean, <laughs> it was such a puzzle yeah. that things just slipped through and we did the best we could to <laughs> keep everything afloat. As, as, as you say, it's, it's such a complicated puzzle. Uh, when it came time for the editing process, what did that look like? How challenging was that? Well, they mentioned World War Z. <laughs> we were all basically locked in a dark room fighting and crying again. <laughs> And making magic. <laughs> I think this show, this show was really built in the editing room. We, as, we were, as we were watching these cuts come in, there were so many surprises. Like, oh, wow, that's not working? But that's working? How's, what, what is that, how did that happen? And we, just, we made a lot of interesting changes and some really big switches, putting th things from episode two and episode one and episode Eight switched over, you know, like all these different moving parts in the editing room, which is always so fascinating. I know he's not here, but what was it like working with Stanley Tucci? Oh my God. <laughs> Say whatever you want, he's not here. He loves, <laughs> he loves Stanley. Yeah. yeah no, I mean, that man's a dream. He, he, makes, he, he makes everything sound amazing. He makes you feel like you're a genius when he opens his mouth. And it's just, and he's, he's just a very, uh, kind person outside of that and and like Jess brings a certain level of professionalism that sort of raises the bar for everyone else that that works on the set and performs other questions I can think I see a hand at the back yes I, no, not necessarily. I actually think one of the most interesting things that Facebook brought to us was that they wanted to do it as a half hour drama. And it's not how it was originally conceived and actually wasn't how we originally wrote the adaptation and it's something we've come to love. And to me, I actually think the half hour drama is sort of the promise of, for, or fulfilling the promise of what we thought streaming TV could be. You know, everyone thought it would start like breaking models, but ultimately most streaming dramas ended up being about an hour. And finally, we're starting to see it's something very different with the half hour drama, which to me is kind of unpredictable and very playful. And there's a lot more focus to it. And I just love that Facebook was all about that. I mean, I, th I think maybe a while ago, you w in back a couple of years ago when it was so new, all you know, streaming and formats were changing and platforms were changing, maybe there would have been a more fear b based around it. But I think the way that that I was looking at it and we were looking at it was through a creative lens and Facebook has been an amazing partner and listen, fought us on the right things and was right about many things and let us win a lot of battles as well. And that, you know, how, how your partner is working with you in a creative way for me more than anything will give me a, a, a sort of insight to was this the right move, you know? Because, listen, who, it, 
are people going to watch this? I don't know. Are people going to like it? We don't know. We're going to make it because we like it. And all we can do is, is do that. And if we have a partner who is, who is on the same page, like, are we making the, te- the same television show and that they wanted to make? And we were, and we were all wanting to push and wanting to, you know, press the boundaries of what had been on their platform and what they were willing to experience and try with us and risk with us. And it's, it was a really thoroughly uh, good experience from a creative standpoint. And I think that's what I'm looking for. I mean, if someone's willing to take a risk with us, then we're willing to take a risk with you. Questions? If I don't see a hand, it's because the light's in my face. <laughs> uh, right here. Well, actually, originally, it, I think it was uh, South Dakota. Like that, that was sort of where I put it because it was it was based on the cave systems, like the limestone cave systems. And uh, actually, it was a conversation with Skip where I was like, you know, what's funny is actually the li- largest limestone cave system is in Tennessee. And he's like, well, why don't we just put it in Tennessee? And I was like, well, I'm from there. It's kind of weird. He's like. No one knows you're from there. Who cares? <laughs> it's not any weirder than South Dakota. Yeah, so I was just like, all right, I should just embrace this. It's where I'm from. I kind of know what's, what's, what's what there. So that was the reasoning behind it. So uh, unfortunately, we're all out of time, but I just wanted to give a huge thanks to all of you for joining us and uh, yeah, showing this series to us. Thank you very much. All right, if everyone could remain seated for a second, we're just going to uh, head out, and uh, uh, then you can get out of here. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.